Hello, everyone. This is One Day at a Time podcast. It captures the challenges we face daily and what we learn or not learn from it. My name is Uche Agbai, or Sensei Uche. Welcome. We are the wind in the sails of your business. We are your compass. Chart your course towards your targets. Africa Business Radio. Towards a profitable Africa. Meraba San Nisosen. <laughs> Don't worry, guys. <laughs> it is still me. I just said hello and how are you in Turkish? Well, that's because today's episode is titled Istanbul. Welcome to One Day at a Time. My name is Uche Agbay. I am your host in the media circles. I am known as Sensei Uche. This is my journey or the chronicles of my journey to through beating cancer here on the podcast one day at a time istanbul turkey was where i chose you know that was the place i chose to have my treatment after having two sessions of chemotherapy back here in lagos nigeria and there were no signs of improvement after i had those two sessions of chemotherapy my friends and uh, my family of course my doctor um, at the time, who is still my friend, also Dr. Johnson, was like, okay, you know what, we need to get you outside of the country. And there were so many efforts, you know, so many suggestions, London, Paris, the United States, India. Yeah. But in the end, we settled for Istanbul, Turkey. And that was made possible you know, that happening was made possible by someone that was truly remarkable and God sent in my treatment journey to beating cancer. Today, it is my pleasure to have on one day at a time, Dr. <laughs> Dayo Shubamowo. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Dr. Dayo Shubamowo yeah. is a Nigerian yeah. third generation medical doctor. I'm a healthcare management consultant with over 19 years of international healthcare business experience. Dr. Dayo has executed numerous innovative healthcare infrastructure projects and healthcare financing solutions for international development agencies, multinational organizations, and governments in Africa and Europe. It's a great pleasure that I welcome Dr. Dayo to the show. Dr. Dayo, how are you doing today? <laughs> Man, good man. Thank God it's Friday. Thank God uh, it's Friday. <laughs> What's your Friday routine? Normally, you just get as much booze as possible. <laughs> you know, the funny thing is, we always think of doctors as being, mm. you know, not don't drink, don't do anything, don't have fun. Boy. They're just very serious, Boy. boring people. But well, <laughs> all I can say is depends on the doctor. Yeah. Um, I mean, I studied medicine in Lagos, so I'm an old one-bed doctor. <laughs> Those that study medicine in, in the village, uh -huh. <laughs> may not be social. Okay, Dr. Dyer, very, 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 very good to have you on the show today. Let's get into this. How many cases have you had prior or prior to meeting me? How many cases similar to mine where somebody around my age, you know, group, needing treatments, cancer in Lagos, Nigeria. As at that time, you know, in 2017, 2016, even before that time, did you have cases mm -hmm. like that on a regular? To be honest, the cancer cases at Hanu Band were, were all like, I would say people above 60. Okay. The young case was pretty, it wasn't a norm, like a young, otherwise fit person. Not diagnosed with cancer. So, I mean, in medicine, like they say, you never say never. Yeah. Um, but based on my own experiences, that was a very unique case. Okay. And is this something that you have seen repeat itself after that time? Should we be well, worried in our society, young people? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, So one thing I can tell you now is not only is there an, a cancer epidemic in Nigeria, but the epidemic has sort of skewed all the things that you know we learned in school especially based on age yeah so now i'm seeing babies you know having cancer you know teenagers in fact it's really sad but um, a colleague of mine just lost his niece last Oof. week 
13 year old to cancer who was still yeah what was she just trying to get her fit enough you know to travel she passed away so something is going on i really don't know what it is i have my guesses but all i can say is right now it seems there's no there's no age limit you know for cancer that's just really sad a 13 year old and trying mm. to get out and one of the most frustrating things even when i was you know trying to get treatment back then in nigeria is that the quality of treatment that we're supposed to be getting is mm. not available it's not readily available yeah. maybe it's available in some places or to a few people as regards mm. the funds and all that but it's not readily mm. available here how frustrating is that no it's very very frustrating because you need to get a diagnosis like you saw yeah in your case you know it's an issue and if you don't have a right diagnosis then i mean where do you even start from yeah but i must say that since your time we've had many more investments in cancer both from the government uh the private sector so in fact the patient i was telling you about that died last week yeah she was in a private cancer center in vdi that's where they were trying to stabilize her you know, yeah for she could fly out but with a country of 200 million like what you have on ground it's still a joke right it's grossly inadequate and even in terms of cost i remember the, the girl's uncle was telling me that for one week that they stayed in that place in vi she could spend over five million now just yeah. on stabilization you know yeah so it's one thing is access and another thing is affordability it's it's a big problem having access to that type of for instance in Istanbul, one of the things that I learned in my time there was that they had or they have over, and this is just one state, they have over 30 places, and that was back then, where you could have radiotherapy and chemotherapy treatments in one state, over 30 hospitals with state-of-the-art medical equipment but we don't even have how many do we even have in nigeria right now because i remember the machine radiotherapy machine at i think luth wasn't working was yes. broken down mm -hmm. then i also wanted to go to a hospital in a keja and theirs mm -hmm. was over how do i yeah. it was over stressed because there were so many people yeah. like do we have an improvement in the numbers or places um, where we yeah, can yeah. get yeah, standard yeah, treatments have, have an improvement we have an improvement. So, for example, that machine you're mentioning, that's a PET scan. Yeah. Um, so we have about five PET scanners in Nigeria now, which is a far cry from... In Nigeria, not even in Lagos, yeah. in the whole of Nigeria, no. five. Yeah. Compared to 13 in one state. Mm -hmm. Outside the country, man. Okay, Doctor, let me ask you. So, mm. I'm trying to get a background as regards the kind of person that you are that's where this question is leading to. What made you go into medical tourism? What was that point oh. in your life that, you know, you're, because I know you do a lot of things in the medical mm -hmm. um, field, but that particular mm -hmm. sector, mm -hmm. what pushed you into that? Okay, so I'll be very honest with you. I'll say I stumbled into it accidentally. And I'll, I'll say it was just fate. In 2012, I got invited to a medical tourism conference in Jordan, yeah? And at that conference, that's when I met Emmy Chapman, you know, who you know. That's yeah. the chairman of the Turkish Healthcare Travel Council. Yeah. And basically, he was just saying that, look, I come from Turkey, government is willing to spend so much on marketing the country as a medical tourism destination and is looking for partners like in sort of attractive markets yeah. who can facilitate patients you know and he was like you know i'm thinking maybe it was somebody from nigeria to work with and you know at the time you know i was just curious and then funny enough it was at the time where i already made up my mind to resign from nine to five yeah that i had at the time so of course any sort of business prospects you know in the medical line looks interesting you know and that's how we signed an agreement and then you know, we started working and funny enough the first patient that i sent to turkey was my dad because hmm. my dad had a cancer scare you know at that time 
misdiagnosed here in Lagos. The poor man already started taking chemo. Yeah. Only for him to get to Turkey and all I know cancer. Wow. They don't take any chemo. That's something like chemo for like two weeks. Damn. No, go ahead, go ahead. Are you done? Yeah, so you know, we got there and we did their barrage of tests and we realized rather than cancer, it was just gallstones which they removed. Yeah. But that's a big worry here because one of the things I also experienced back in Nigeria was that I was asked to do tests and I had to go to different places. Different places, different results, different professionals mm-hmm. with different, you know, examination mm-hmm. results. And that was confusing, you know, as trying to determine the treatments that was ideal for my case. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people would, you know, get the wrong treatments just because yeah. we don't have the testing facilities or we just don't have everything in one place, you know? Okay. So, Dr. Dial. I got to know you in 2017, but I want to hear from you how you got to know me, how you got to find out about my case. I have, <laughs> I have some story, but I would like to uh, hear how you got to find uh, out. Okay, so it's very interesting. So sometime in 2017, I made an appearance on a radio show. Yeah. Um, it's a travel show hosted by um, TT Dynamite. And it's called Medical Poison. <laughs> So, the next thing, Titi just blowing up my phone. I'm like, ah, what's wrong with this woman? <laughs> so, I now called her back. And she's not like, oh, nah. I mean, she has a friend, though, who seems to have cancer. And that literally, the guy is just getting worse every day. So, we need to get him out you know, very quickly. And yeah. that, do I have any suggestions? And then after that, she now meets me up with her husband. Oscar, yeah, a great guy, and I met up with Oscar. You know, Oscar basically, what I liked about him was, I think, even though he wasn't a medical professional, but he saw the need for speed, hmm. you know, and that's why he he was just pushing. Now, you know what? So one, let's have options, you know, and two, let's have the funds, you know, to make it happen, and so that's how. I also came to see you. Yeah. Uh, I must say, maybe I didn't tell you, probably because of the condition you were in. So I know a large part of healing is psychology. And as medics, we're trained not to, you know, let, you know, patients sort of either be scared or, or lose Or faith. not be optimistic, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but seeing you in your apartment... Like, you didn't even breathe through your nose. Yeah. The mask had extended to your nose. Breathe through your mouth. You had lost so much weight. My guy was scared, though. I don't like it. Did you, I think, I, I did you just... think I wasn't going to make it? So, the thing about it is, I knew you would make it, and I'll tell you why. So, number one is, a young fit guy. Obviously, you have a higher chance than, say, an elderly, obese person that has, like, existing morbidities like maybe hypertension diabetes yeah. you know and all that and then for me eh, i'm sorry if i'm sounding spiritual but no 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 go ahead come I, on i'm a very spiritual person yeah and i feel that the same god who raised men and women to one connected to me and then two to raise the funds then it was supposed enough to complete it like if he wasn't gonna heal you then would have one or two things. Either all the sort of moves to get you abroad would fail, would fail, or the money wouldn't be raised. So I just felt, once again, it was fate that connection was at the right time, and then everything else just seemed to fall in place. So yeah, I didn't feel you wouldn't make it. But for me, I think it was just shocking seeing a young man like myself, you know, suffering like that. No, it was touching. Was the touching. first time you've seen anybody in that, in that kind of... Uh, I know I've seen people. Don't, don't forget. Like, <laughs> yes, I've, I've, too. I've, I've, I've worked in a teaching hospital, you know, and in teaching hospitals in Nigeria, like you see everything. You see, you, see, you see people that have been either mismanaged, you know, elsewhere, and then the doctor is like, you know, don't come and die in my hospital. Let me just refer you <laughs> to Luke. Okay, you get. Yeah. Or you see people that have gone to like other hospitals and you know still haven't been able to get better and then just ship them off to the last port of call. So I've seen all kinds of cases. But Before, at the same time, yeah, I haven't lost my humanity. 
Hmm. Otherwise, based on what I've seen, I actually should be a robot. I should yeah, be that's what I was even going to ask. I was going to say, like, how do you deal with it? You know, you just mentioned you haven't lost your humanity. You are still a human. All these things still affect you, even if you are hmm. trained to, you know, ride over it, so to speak. But well, how do you hmm. do it? What do you do to keep yourself going, uh, keep your mind in a... Well, I think for me, it's just having that awareness that it's very easy to just use your humanity it always keeps me in check and i don't like to you at the end of the day it's also the grace of god yeah you know? yeah yeah okay so how difficult was it like you said dr um oscar was always i know oscar was you know was adamant on speed you know, mm-hmm. always on call with you you were also graciously always available thank you so much mm-hmm. for that dr dial but how difficult was it you know just tell me getting the visa because i know we had to move to abuja you know was there uh, well to be honest it wasn't difficult simply because the organization that i partner with they're funded by the turkish government so they have access to diplomatic privileges and that's why in your case we're able to just automatically speak with the ambassador and it's like you know what just come over we see you that same day. So, yeah, that's how that happened. I wouldn't say it was difficult. Okay. Guys, it's still one day at a time. Dr. Dio is my guest today. He was the one that helped facilitate speedily me going to Istanbul, Turkey for treatment at Medicana International. And I said earlier that one of the things he said to me that really, really assured me, and there was a way that you said it, to be honest that your dad went to the same hospital because i i was scared you say you were scared (laughs) (laughs) me i was scared i didn't well let me not say i didn't think i would make it but i was scared i was scared i had to keep a brave face for a lot of people but it was really Mm -hmm. really hard for me does it trouble you when you see nigerians that need quality healthcare and they can't get it does it trouble uh, you as a to person be to be honest i think trouble is an understatement mm. it just i don't know it's what keeps me awake at night just trying to see you know how can we just let every nigerian have access to you mm. know just good and affordable health care and to be honest that's what has forged my career um, it's what I do. And basically, made me move from being just one doctor, like working in a hospital, to somebody, you know, working more on, let's say, commercial side of healthcare. Because the yeah. way I look at it is, look, if I'm a doctor working in a hospital, even if I walk around the clock, at most, maybe I see 20 patients a day. Yeah? But you have no idea the amount of impact I have. Uh, be able to make the kind of work I do. And I'll give you a small example. So I was able to do a project for an oil and gas company in River State. And through that initiative, like over 200,000 people in that community, like, are getting excellent healthcare as close to nothing. Wow. The shell for, sorry, yeah, so the oil company, like, they're subsidizing, you know, that community health insurance scheme. That's fantastic. It's like 90% of the premiums, you know. So I'm all about efficiency. I'm, I'm all about impact, you know. And that's why I choose to work on things more from a system point of view. From a systemic to, point of view. Fixing yeah, the system, it, yeah, improving yeah. it, making it better, making it more effective. And one of the things that I also realized is that it's like there's that money in healthcare that could be kept in Nigeria. Like, if we develop our healthcare system, yeah, there is so much that we can make from it and even, you know, keep improving the system. And it's so frustrating that the people that are supposed to know this Mm -hmm. are not even doing what they're supposed to do to make this available, to make healthcare available for every single Nigerian. If there was one thing you could say to me back then, and now, looking at, you know, what I went through back then and now, mm-hmm. if there was anything you could say about me, what would it be? Mm. <laughs> mm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, 
<laughs> okay, okay. So this is me just being very, what's it called? <laughs> being very frank. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I realized at your time, you were really pissed off at the system. Oh, right? I am still. You gave me the feeling, you know, like Nigeria betrayed you. You get? Yeah. And you are also wondering, what well, if you didn't have the means to have gone? So we just have you want that statistic that just died you know, yeah. because of the failed system. Meanwhile, you have guys who are in government spending a fraction, you know, of what what um, is required to, yeah, to make an impact you know. in the system. Yeah, yeah, so you know, the voices. But I think now, yeah, you're still pissed. But I think what you're doing now is you're turning that disappointment and anger into trying in your own little way to improve things. And one of the ways they're trying to do that is by one, creating the awareness as to how, you know, deprived the system is. And then also trying to make people make these our leaders like accountable. You know, like you can't just keep quiet or pretend that, you know, you don't see what's going on. So I may be wrong, but that's what I see about you. I see you channeling your anger into something that potentially could be positive. And, you know, so that we won't have someone like you, you know, who is not fortunate enough having to die, you know, for no reason. Just because we don't have either the right facilities or the right workforce, you know, to deal with that kind of ailment. Yeah. To be honest, it was really frustrating for me. I am still angry at the system because, yes, the system can be better, a lot better. When I came back from Istanbul, I actually did go around trying and then do you know what people said to me all the places that i went wow. to they were like see we've had people like you in the past mm. go outside for treatment come back angry and want to change the system and then when they try and try and try they are frustrated and that really really broke my heart to be honest because i'm like okay so you, you're trying to actually make a change and effect the change mm-hmm. and the system is working against that change and you know mm-hmm. having that change affected that's really frustrating dr dial i want to say thank you so much for coming on this episode amazingly we are <laughs> we're almost out of time wow um yeah we're, we're almost out of time but thank you so much for coming through it has been a pleasure you know talking to you and also hearing your side of you know my journey which didn't just stop at you you know helping me get to istanbul when i was at istanbul you kept in touch when i came Mm -hmm. back you also kept in touch and you helped me through you know go through it every day one day at a time thank you so much dr dyer you're welcome i'm going to say this to everyone out there listening to one day at a time today let's do all we can in every way we can to see how we can improve our healthcare system in Nigeria. One, there are financial benefits to having world-class and state-of-the-art medical healthcare systems in Nigeria. Two, it will just save lives. It's a no-brainer. Lives will be saved and there are people that need this. So don't get frustrated. Don't lose hope. Let's do what we can. The country is as crazy as it can get, but let's keep it going, okay? Thank you so much for being on One Day at a Time. Dr. Dyer, can you just give uh, mm-hmm. information about yourself, maybe on LinkedIn, on uh, social media, just so that people can reach out mm-hmm. to you if they want to talk to you more and also get um, okay. help? Okay, so on Instagram is Dr. That's so it's fully spelled D O C T O R underscore Adayo. Yeah. On LinkedIn is Dr. Ade Dyer Shobamo. Okay. And on Facebook, is at the Dio Shubamor. Okay. So, guys, if you have any needs and you want to reach out to Dr. Dio, he just put out his information. So, please reach out to him. And I wish you all the best. And we'll be praying for you also. My name is Uche Agbai. Thank you for being on this episode one day at a time. My socials is at Sensei Uche across all platforms. I would definitely love to hear and get feedback from you. Until next time and next episode, keep living one day at a time.